Okay, we are in Deuteronomy um, chapter 33. It's going to be the second page, Jan. I forgot that I'd done uh, chapter 20 or 32 already. And so we're going we're gonna to start with the blessing of God on the nations. And so chapter 33, let's pray for the study and we'll get into it. Um, Father, we come before you, and, and again, Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that you teach us and that, that you speak through it. And Lord, we want you to speak through it here this evening too. Um, Lord, we thank you that you're a God who hears us. And you don't only, only hear us, but you, you speak to us and, and you work in us, Lord. And so um, you said that where two or three are gathered in your midst or in your name, that you'd be there in the midst. And that's what we want, Lord. We want you walking up and down in the midst of the church. So work in us this morning or this evening and uh, just bless the time. And we ask that you do this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we're going to finish up Deuteronomy. And this actually may be a pretty short study because there's not a lot in these passages. Um, but in chapter 32, uh, basically, uh, you have uh, Moses uh, giving out the history again of the people of Israel. Um, it's the song of Moses in that, in that passage. And he talks about the fact that they're going to uh, go into the promised land. They're going to get everything that God told them that they were going to get, but then they were going to be unfaithful to the Lord and that God was going to chastise them. Um, he lets them know at the end of the chapter that uh, the hammer that he hammers them with is going to get hammered. <laughs> you know? And so God's going to use other nations to uh, deal with Israel um, when they're in rebellion against him. Uh, but one of the things that you see, um, we were just talking about Jeremiah um, in sharing, and one of the things that you see with the nations that came in and uh, uh, took over Israel uh, was they just did it with relish. They just went after the Jews. And um, that God uh, made it clear um, before the fact that because of their attitude and their arrogance, uh, that they were going to end up being judged, even though they were used as a tool for judgment. Okay, And so Moses just basically goes through and lines out what their history is going to be. And um, on the face of it, it's not a good thing. I mean, standing there listening to him, you're about to go into the promised land. They're on the verge of the promised land. They're on the other side, on the other side of the Jordan River, about to go into, into Canaan. And um, they're getting this whole picture of what their history is going to end up like, and it's not looking good. And um, I think that um, that is telling in the sense that God doesn't deal with us necessarily in the way that the books say that we should be dealt with. I think that a lot of times people think that if you come up to somebody with bad news, and especially bad news about where your life's going to go if you keep going this direction, that it's too harsh and too hard and it won't help, and um, it's just going to depress people and that kind of thing. And, and what we want is people to just uplift us and say, you know, only nice things, say only nice things about me, say only good things about me. And there are times when um, God's speaking through Moses or God's speaking through one of the other prophets, he just doesn't do that. He just tells people what's up. And the reason is because he cares about them. And, you know, there are times when, when you need to have um, your bell rung. You need to have your bell rung. Um, when I played football, my first year, um, I started playing football, football in my sophomore year, and um, I didn't know I didn't know how to play the game, and I wasn't very good at it, and so I didn't start. And uh, where they put me at was wide receiver, and I was fast, um, if you can imagine that. <laughs> I, I was fast, but I had hands of brick. You know, when I would catch a ball, it would just, I wouldn't catch the ball. It would just bounce off my hands. So it was a lousy position to put me in. And so consequently, I didn't play very much. There was this one time when I'm coming back from a game and there were some guys on the team that, that would hassle me at times. And I was coming back from a, a game sitting in, in the bus and one of the guys said something to me. I can't remember what it was, but I just went off on him. Just told him to shut his face and yelled at him and, you know, that, that kind of thing. Not, not a huge big thing. I didn't hit him or anything, but, and, you know, it, it was clear. To the, the whole bus got quiet when I, when I did this whole thing. My coach stands up at the front of the bus and he goes, Winery, uh, I want to see you on Monday for extracurricular activities. And so it was me and this one other guy. And so we, you know, we go through practice. And so, you know, you did tired after practice. The, the end of practice, you're running wind sprints. And uh, so we're dead tired. And so the coach comes up and he goes, you know, basically he goes, your behavior's out of line. Shouldn't have been doing it. And so I'm going to run you. And uh, so we have this thing called the, the bear cage. 
and it's a uh, uh, you know it's basically made out of steel, and it's a cage that's about yay tall, so you can't stand up in it. And so it's got an opening on both ends, and and it's about oh five yards long, and you you had to do bear crawls through this thing. And so the coach made me go through that thing. It had to be 50 times. Uh, he made me go through it. And, um, and I'm mad. And the reason I'm mad is because it's not fair because coach knows this guy's been hassling me and he deserved, he deserved way more than getting yelled at on a bus. And, um, and he's not out there and I'm out there and I'm having a bad attitude and stuff like that. So I do my 50 bear crawls. And the other guy that's out there with me, he's, he sends him in. And he goes, go on in. And he goes, Winter, I need to talk to you some more. And he goes, are you mad? I go, yeah, I'm mad, coach. And he goes, you want to hit me? And I just kept my mouth shut. Didn't say anything. And he goes, you do. He goes, four-point stance. And he used to be a linebacker in college. And so when, uh, when he was in college, he probably weighed about 220, 230. Um, at the time, he's my coach. He, played, he weighs about 170, and I weighed about you know 190 at that point. So I'm like okay, I'm tired, but I'm going to pop you. <laughs> and so you want to get in front of me? And, and so I can't, you know, he go, you know, he calls me off the line, you know, get, does a count, calls me off the line, and he just plows into my head, knocks me sideways. And then, you know, he does it again, does it again. And, you know, that had to go on for, you know, a good 15 minutes of me getting down on the line. And every time he's doing it, I'm getting madder and, and, and going after him and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, then he gets up, or I, you know, I get done. He goes, okay, we're done. Let's walk in. And so we go walking in. And as we're walking in, he goes, um, I can't remember exactly his words, but they were to the effect of, you're a lousy wide receiver. <laughs> and he goes, but you can hit good. And so I'm going to try you out as defensive end. And so, you know, he's walking in, and I'm, I'm red in the face and all this stuff, and walk in and, Next week, um, I'm a defensive end, and it's where I belonged. It was a, it was a good spot for me. And um, he became my favorite coach. He beat the snot out of me, but he was my favorite coach. And the reason is because, um, you know, well, the, the reasons are obvious. He, he saw something, and um, he knew that I had an attitude. He knew that, knew that things needed to be fixed. And he just went after it and fixed it. If he had done that today, he'd have probably gone to jail. <laughs> you know, I don't know if he would have or not. But um, he, he saw an attitude and that needed to be fixed. And so I ended up being defensive end on my team and all league and all of that kind of stuff. And that is because of Coach um, Jack Baker, right? Doing hard things that most people would not think that you should do in any kind of counseling situation. And that's many times how the Lord is. The Lord will come up and he'll just say things to you. He'll just do things with you. And so that's what God did with the, with the people of Israel. And then the Lord tells um, Moses in, at the end of chapter 32, verse 48, it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses that very same day, saying, Go up uh, this mountain to, of the Abarim, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, across from Jericho, view the land of Canaan, which I give to the children of Israel as a possession, and die on the mountain which you ascend, and be gathered to your people, just as Aaron your brother died on Mount Hor, and was gathered to his people, because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel, in the waters of Meribah, uh, Kadesh, and in the wilderness of Zin, because you did not hallow me in the midst of the children of Israel. Yet you shall see the land before you, uh, before you, though you shall not go there into the land which I am giving to the children of Israel. And so God gives um, Moses the um, end of the people. He shows him the people's end. And then he shows Moses what his end is going to be. And then when you get to chapter 33, this is the, the chapter where Moses is blessing the people of Israel. This is something that you did before you died if you had children. You would call your children into, you see, we see this in, in some places in the Bible. Um, most notable is in uh, Genesis chapter 49. Jacob calls in his 12 sons and he pronounces a blessing on each one of the sons. And that passage is highly prophetic. This one's prophetic too, but that one is prophetic in the sense that it goes all the way to the last times and even to, uh, and, and to the time of Jesus. There are um, some passages in there that speak about uh, the ministry of Christ um, all the way back in the book of Genesis 
um, when God's talking to uh, the tribe of Judah. You have some of the same things. It's a little bit more general when we go through here, but pronouncing a blessing on the son uh, before the father dies. And that's what Moses is doing. In the case of Jacob with his 12 sons, he literally has 12 guys standing in front of him. And he's talking about their future and the future of the tribes that are going to come from him. When we're talking about Moses here, now we've got hundreds of thousands of people, you know, thousands of people in each tribe. And Moses is, is pronouncing a blessing over each one of this. And so let's get into it. Chapter, chapter 33. It says, now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, um, the Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir. He shone from forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. From his right hand came a fiery law for them. Yes, he loves the people. All his saints are in your hand. They sit down at your feet. Everyone receives your words. Moses commanded a law for us, a heritage of the congregation of Jacob, and he was king in Jeshurun. When the leaders of the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. And so the first um, couple of verses up to verse 5 begin with praise to God and a description of the giving of the law at Sinai. And so you have this, this passage in verse 2 where it says, The Lord came from Sinai, dawned on them from Seir, and shone from, uh, forth from Mount Paran, and he came with ten thousands of saints. Um, when Moses was given the law, the Bible talks about the fact that God descended on Mount um, uh, Sinai, and what the people saw was something that looked, you know, frankly, volcanic. There's, there's fire, and there's thunder, and there's lightning, and the people were frightened of the mountain. God, God talks about the fact that they were to not touch the mountain, that they were to be kept back um, lest they be killed. It was a frightening sight, and uh, it ended up in a situation where the people of Israel were like, we don't want to go near that place. Moses, you go up and talk to the Lord, and we'll stay here, and that kind of thing. And so he's describing that. It's not just that that he's describing, though, because when you, you see Mount Sinai in the first verse there, but it says he dawned on them from Seir and shone forth from Mount Paran. And although in, at the end of verse 2, he came with ten thousands of saints, from his right hand came a fiery law for them, that can be talking about Mount Sinai and probably a vision that Moses was given of uh, angels and even people who had passed on before Moses and were in the presence of the Lord. And in that case, you would have guys like Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob and, and Noah and Adam and all of those guys. Um, but it may be talking about angels too, but it looks like also it may be a reference to the coming of the Lord at the second coming because the Bible teaches that Jesus comes from Mount Paran and he comes from Seir when he comes to Jerusalem. When you get to the book of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 63, it specifically talks about Messiah coming, and he comes with 10,000s of his saints and 10,000 times 10,000. And um, uh, he comes and touches down on the Mount of Olives. And so this may be prophetic in the sense that the first law was given at Sinai, but there's coming a time when the kingdom of God on the earth is, is going to come, and it's going to be as fiery as it was when the law was first given. And so that's kind of a cool thing. Jeshurun um, in, the, in the Bible is a, is a term that's uh, descriptive of the Israel. It's the name for Israel, and um, it's a, a, a word that means abundance or fatness. It's the idea of Israel in, uh, in a situation where God is blessing them. And so he says he was king in Jeshurun when the leaders of uh, the people were gathered, all the tribes of Israel together. And then he begins going through and talking about each one of the tribes of Israel. And he starts with Reuben. And Reuben was the first son of Jacob. And so that would be the normal place to start. And he says, let, let Reuben live. And, you know, bef before I move on, I, I, I know that most of you probably know this, but Jacob and Israel are the same guy. So Jacob was the father of the 12 sons, beginning with Reuben, and it goes on and talks about Judah and Levi and, and Naphtali and Benjamin and all these guys. He, Jacob was the physical father of these 12 guys, and his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. 
And so when you have the term the 12 tribes of Israel, you're not talking about 12 tribes that came from a geographical place called Israel. You're talking about 12 tribes that came from 12 sons from a guy named Israel whose previous name had been Jacob. And so that's, that's, what, we're, that's what we're talking about. And so Reuben is the name of the first guy in the tribe of Reuben, and all of the tribe of Reuben that are alive at this point, which is 43,730 men of war in the tribe of Reuben at this point, um, are from Reuben's line. And so in Genesis, uh, Jacob's talking to Reuben, the guy. In Deuteronomy, Moses is talking to Reuben, the tribe, um, who are descendants of this guy. So he says, let Reuben live and not die nor let his men be few. And there's, there's, a, there's a reason that God says it that way. It's because Reuben um, was declining in his population. I told you that he had 43,730. That's not just something I had off the top of my head. It's in my notes here. Because in the book of Numbers, when Reuben first comes out, when they're first numbered, uh, when they come out of Egypt, they have 46,500 men of war. And when they're about to go into the land of Canaan, they only have 43,730 men of war. And what's happening is the tribe of Reuben is declining. And so Moses is pronouncing a blessing on Reuben and um, letting, uh, you know, praying that they would not be few in number. Reuben was never a huge tribe, and uh, some of that has to do with their history. Judah, it says this he said of Judah, hear, hear, Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him to his people. Let his hands be sufficient for him, and may you be a help against his enemies. And so pronouncing on Judah um, the, the blessing of God's help and his, um, um, his protection. Judah was um, one of the first tribes in warfare. Um, when the tribes would go out, um, as far as going out from the camp, uh, Judah was at the front of the three tribes that he was connected with. And so um, God wants him to be blessed in this. Judah, by the way, means praise. And of Levi, this is the tribe of Levi, let your Thummim and your Urim be with your Holy One, whom you tested at Massa and with whom you contended at the waters of Meribah, who says of his father and mother, I have not seen them, nor did he acknowledge his brothers or know his own children, for they have observed your word and kept your covenant. They shall teach Jacob your judgments and Israel your law. They shall put incense before you and a whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the work of his hands. Strike the loins of those who rise against him and of those who hate him, that they rise not again. So Moses was from the tribe of Levi. Um, uh, he, the Levi is the priestly tribe. And when he says, let your Thummim and your Urim be your holy one, he's talking about these two stones that were connected in some way with a high priest's breastplate. And it's one of the ways that they uh, figured out the will of God. Um, the word Thummim means lights and uh Thummim and Urim mean lights and perfections, or perfections and lights. I, I put it backwards. Urim means lights. And um, we don't know how they determine the will of God from this. And so there have, been, there have been some commentators that have talked about maybe it was a white stone and a black stone, and what they did was they had a bag connected to the uh, high priest's um, garments, and they just would reach into the bag, and if they pulled out a white stone, then the answer to the question was yes. If they pulled out a black stone, for example, the answer to the question would be no. Um, and so maybe that's how they did it. The problem with that is when you see the Urim and the Thummim being used in the Bible, there's, there's detail in the direction. It's not yes and no questions. And so when you see passages like, uh, for example, with David, um, they bring the ephod and they question God with the ephod. Well, what the ephod is talking about, an ephod was a high priest's garments. And so included in that would be the, the breastplate and the urim and the thummim and everything that was that went along with that whole thing. And David would ask if he should go into battle and the Lord would give him literally battle plans. And so there's got to be something more going on than just yes or no answers or, you know, throwing dice or 
or that kind of thing. There's got to be something more going on. We just don't have enough information to know what it is. In any case, what um, Moses is praying for is that Levi be led by the perfection and the light of God. And that's where we should be too. We need to be led by the Lord, um, not just people who are going to church or um, just listening to ministers and that kind of stuff. We need to be led by the Lord. And that's what he's praying for the, the people of Levi. When you're in ministry, and some of you guys are in ministry right now, you're in ministry here at Calvary, or you may be in ministry at some point in the future, it's really important to be led by the Lord. You want God's perfections, God's light to be what leads you. And it doesn't need to be something that you got out of the, lo- you know, the next book on, on church growth out of, the, out of the Christian bookstore. Way too many pastors are led by church growth books. books. And way too many pastors are led by uh, you know, what's being stated in Christianity today. In fact, I, I don't even pay attention to those things. Uh, people will come up to me and say, Do you, you know what's happening in the church now? And they'll come up with some goofy thing that somebody's doing because we have Christian publications that go along and catalog all this nonsense. And you got people going to the left and people going to the right and people doing all kinds of whacked out stuff and people doing things that just aren't wise. And the reason that they end up in these places is because they're not being led by the Lord. And that's what we need. We need to be led by the Lord. You pick your Bible up, you you spend some time in it, you ask Jesus to speak to you through it. Nobody's changed in the thousands of years since the Bible was written. Everybody acts exactly the same way. It's shocking how little humanity has changed over time. And in fact, um, uh, with, with much of uh, what we get into, um, we don't even have the wisdom that they had in, you know, in the 1800s. Have you ever read a book from the 1800s? They have a vocabulary that's ridiculous in just common literature from the 1800s. You, you, pick up, you pick up a book from that, and I'm not even talking about you know, a situation where uh, you know, the, the language has changed. It's just that these people had a, had a vocabulary, and if you have half a vocabulary, you can read it. But a lot of times, when I'm reading a book from the 1800s, I got a dictionary next to me because they're using terms that I don't know. I've never even heard of them. So you go back and you figure, you know, figure it out, and these guys are, you know, some of these guys are you know, from the woods. And they've got, to, they've got this, this vocabulary. And, um, you know, when we, when we look at our culture, a lot of times we think that we're way above this, and we're not. People haven't changed. And so the things that God had to say to these people way back when um, relate to us because humanity is just humanity. And if you want to know how your life should go, you pick up God's book, you open it up, you ask God to speak to you from it, And you'll be led by God's perfection and by God's light. And that's the way that it works. And I don't know a better way to have your life um, be led by the Lord. Um, He talks about the fact that these guys were tested um, at Massa and Meribah. And that they were um, impartial at the test with the golden calf. Massa and Meribah is is a place where people were whining about the fact that they didn't have water. And um, in verse 9, it says, who, who says of his father and mother, I have not seen them, nor did he acknowledge his brothers or know his own children, for they, they have observed your word and kept your covenant. And what he's talking about is the, the fact that the tribe of Levi was the tribe that stood up at the test with the golden calf. What, what, remember that whole story? Moses goes up in, into the mountain. Um, he's gone for 40 days. Everybody goes, he's dead. You know, where do, you know, we don't know this Moses. And they decide, let's make another, you know, another idol. They've got Mount Sinai sitting there on fire in front of them. And they come up with, let's make an idol. And we're going to turn away from our covenant with God. And we're going to worship a calf. And so that's what they do. They convince um, Aaron to do exactly that. And so these guys go after it. And so they, you know, they begin worshiping, you know, Bessie, the cow, instead of God, the Lord. And when Moses comes down, God lets Moses know what's going on there. And when Moses comes down, he breaks the, the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And a hole opens up and swallows them. No, that, do, that doesn't happen. That's in the movie. That's not in the book. He breaks the commandments and says, you don't deserve these because you violated your covenant with God. And he goes and he yells to the tribes, who's with the Lord? Okay. And it's the tribe of Levi that says we are. So it's a tribe of Levi that separate themselves. And then Moses goes, 
it's time to, you know, make accounts. And there were 3,000 people that were put to death that day. They were hardcore Bessie worshipers. Bessie the cow worshipers. Hardcore cow worshipers. They'd seen the work of God. They'd seen the, the hand of God. They'd seen what God had done with Moses. They'd been taken out of the, the land of, uh, of Egypt with miracles uh, being provided with them. God says, I took you out with a strong arm. And in the end, they abandon God and go after a stupid cow that they made up. And when they get called on it, they apparently want to fight about it. And so it's the tribe of Levi that stands up and they fight through it. And there's 3,000 people that end up being killed from that because they were hardcore cow worshipers. They fought with the people of Israel. Which, again, when you, when you look at that story, we just did this not too long ago on, on Sunday morning. When you look at that story, basically what you have is 3,000 people, specifically guys, 3,000 guys who influenced almost a million people to go after this cow. And when it comes to making a stand against the 3,000 guys who influenced these people to abandon God and go after the cow, most of the tribes of Israel just stand back and do zip. They do nothing. And it's only the tribe of Levi that stands up and says, we're going to do something about this. It's amazing how few people can trash um, a large amount of people's lives. And we see some of that going on right now. So we've got stuff going on in the United States where, where, where people do things and political power, and there's not very many of them. And the vast majority of people, you know, on, in the country, you know, don't go along with a lot of the nonsense that they come up with. And even with some of the nonsense that they come up with, when they're under, you know, I was just reading a, uh, an article about LGBTQ attitudes during the time of Barack Obama versus now. Did you know that more and more people are having a negative attitude towards the LGBTQ um, uh, agenda than they were even last year? And what that tells me is that you've got people who are making some kind of stand, at least when the pollsters talk to them, they're making some kind of stand based on, on what they think is popular instead of based on what they think is true. And so the fact that they've decided, well, maybe that's not such a great idea at this point. Oh, well, great. But, you know, a couple of years ago, you're all in. So what's the difference? What's going on? And they, you know, came up with things like, well, maybe the LGBTQ thing is getting too rowdy and they're being too up in people's faces and, and that kind of stuff. And that may be the case. But you know what I think it really is? I think that people are swayed. I think that people can be swayed from very few people. And that when it comes up to standing up for what's right, most people will, you know, take a, you know, take a back row and let somebody else do the hard work in a situation. And that's what happened with Israel. So you had hundreds of thousands of men who could have stood up against 3,000 guys because they all repented in the end. Hundreds of thousands of men who could have stood up against 3,000 guys and the only group that ever did anything was the tribe of Levi. And that's what God is commending them for. It's one of the, the reasons that they became the priestly tribe. You want to be somebody who stands up for the things of God. You want to be somebody who's a faithful high priest, a faithful priest to the Lord. And so you have that. He talks about the fact that um, they are people who are teaching and praying and worshiping. They shall teach Jacob your judgments, verse 10, Israel your law. They shall put incense before you, that's in prayer, and whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. Bless his substance, Lord, and accept the work of his hands. Strike the loins of those who rise against him, and that's God's protection, and of those who hate him, that they rise not again. You guys are Levite. The Bible says that we're priests to God. And so this is the priestly tribe, and that's what God would have you do. Be somebody who's a stand-up person, who stands up for what's right, and not just, be, not just because it's popular, or because you think that people are going to back you up. You need to be able to stand up in a situation where um, it looks like most people are taking a back seat and do the right thing. You need to be somebody who's able to teach what God has to say. You need to be somebody who's a man or a woman of prayer. And you need, need to be somebody who has a sacrifice. Our sacrifice is Christ. You need to be somebody that's like that. And when you have that kind of life, God is the one who protects you. God is the one who rises up, up against your enemies. So you have that. Of Benjamin, he said, the beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him 
who shelters him all the day long, and he shall dwell between his shoulders. And so Benjamin, um, the, actually the portion of his land, when it talks about he shall dwell between his shoulders, um, Benjamin's land um, actually looks like shoulders. And Jerusalem is right smack in the middle of it. Jerusalem's not in Benjamin, but it looks like that. And so Benjamin was the youngest son of Jacob, and uh, Benjamin means son of my right hand. Um, Joseph, of Joseph, he said, blessed of the Lord is his land with the precious things of heaven, with the dew and the deep lying beneath, with the precious fruits of the sun, with the precious produce of the months, with the best things of the ancient mountains, with the precious things of the everlasting hills, with the precious things of the earth in its fullness and the favor of him who dwelt in the bush. Let the blessing come on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. And you remember the story of, of Joseph. Um, uh, Joseph was uh, basically sold into slavery by his brothers, he went down to Egypt, and um, he was restored to his family better than 20 years after the fact. And um, he ended up being the savior of his family. Joseph is a type of Christ in the Old Testament. There's 101 types of Christ in Joseph's life. Um, uh, To the point where, do you guys remember who betrayed Jesus? What's his name? Judas. You know what it is in Hebrew? Judah. You know who betrayed Joseph? Yeah, it was Judah. Judah. And so Reuben wanted to let Joseph go. Judah decided to sell him. And so they sold him for 20 pieces of silver. It was the price of a slave. The price of a slave went up over time. By the time uh, it was the time of Jesus, you know what the price of a slave was? Yeah, 30 pieces of silver. And so Judah sold um, Joseph for the price of a slave. And you have a, a number of other things that go on, go on in that. And in any case, um, it's um, Joseph that um, God blessed. There were two tribes that came out of Joseph. And so this is another one of those technical things that you have when you go through the Bible. There are always 12 tribes of Israel listed. There are times when the 12 tribes are listed differently. And so if Levi is being mentioned in the list of 12 tribes, then Joseph is mentioned. If Levi is not listed in the 12 tribes, like when they give out the land, Um, Levi didn't get a specific portion of land, then Joseph is broken up into two tribes, and that is Manasseh and Ephraim, and those two tribes come from the tribe of Joseph. Remember, Joseph had two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. They were grandsons of Jacob, and when Jacob blessed them, he blessed the younger over the older, and there's this whole scene where Joseph's like, no, father, this one's the older. And he says, yes, he is, but God's going to bless this guy more. And so I'm paraphrasing for you. In any case, Manasseh and Ephraim became full tribes, and the reason that that happened, and again, I don't mean to get into the weeds here, but I'm going to. Um, when, when they would bless their sons, if you had four sons, you gave five portions And so each one of your sons got one portion of whatever you were going to give them as their inheritance. The eldest son got another one. He got what was called the double portion, okay? And so I have four sons. I'm going to break up my my, uh, inheritance. I'm going to give it to them. And when I'm, you know, if I have uh, $500,000 that I'm going to give to my children, I'm going to break it up into five parts. I'm going to give 100,000 to each one of them and another 100,000 to my eldest son, and that's called a double portion. And that's what the people of Israel would do. When it comes to Jacob blessing his sons, his son Reuben should have gotten the double portion. But he didn't, and the reason that he didn't is because he slept with one of his father's wives. You know, when you go through and you look at what, what the Bible has to say about these guys, these guys were really clueless on all kinds of levels. And uh, specifically that story Um, is identifying what's going on with the tribes of Israel, specifically when when, uh, Joseph was in Egypt. In any any case, um, Reuben doesn't get the double portion because of that. And so what what Jacob does is he gives the double portion to his son Jacob, or excuse me, to his son Joseph. And so double portion, two sons for Joseph, one portion goes to each son, 
And so you actually have 13 portions given out by the Lord to the tribes of Israel, and two of them go to Joseph, one for Manasseh and one for Ephraim. And so when um, Israel is pictured without Levi, you have Manasseh and Ephraim mentioned. When Israel is pictured with Levi, you have Joseph mentioned. And either way, you get 12 tribes. Is that clear as mud? Yeah, okay. So you're going you're gonna to run into that. And so when, when Joseph is being blessed here, it's both the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. And um, uh, Manasseh got portions on both sides of the Jordan River. Uh, before they went in, uh, there was a half tribe uh, that um, uh, took their portion on the on the other side of the Jordan River, and so the blessing that's been given to these guys are a blessing that covers huge portions of the land of Israel. In fact, Ephraim had uh, his portion in the land of Israel, and Ephraim became synonymous with the northern tribe of Israel. And so, as you're going through the Kings and the and the Chronicles. Uh, you'll see Israel mentioned and Judah mentioned, and those are two nations, the northern nation of Israel, southern nation of Judah. And when Israel is mentioned, they will um, use the name Ephraim as synonymous with Israel. And so it'll talk about Ephraim, it'll talk about Israel, back and forth like that. And people get confused by that. But the reason it's, it is that way is because Ephraim became the most blessed of the tribes, of the ten tribes uh, that compose the northern kingdom of, of Israel. Is that clear as mud? Okay, so um, you have those things going on. So agricultural blessing, timber, military blessing, God pours out his blessing on, on those guys. And then we have Zebulun and Issachar. Of, and of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, and you're going out in Issachar in your tents. They shall call the peoples to the mountains they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness, for they shall partake of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hidden in the sand. Zebulun and Issachar um, were, were two tribes that were in the middle of the land of Israel. And um, one of the tribes bound, had boundaries up against the Sea of Galilee, and the other tribe was close to the Mediterranean, not right on the border of the Mediterranean or the coast of the Mediterranean, but very close. And so what it's talking about is that because of the positioning of these tribes, they were going to get blessing from both the seas. So the Mediterranean Sea and also the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is a, is a very pretty place and there's a real agricultural blessing that goes on there. It talks about treasures hidden in the, in the sand. And this um, verse right here, and then in, let's see, what is the other one? In, down in verse 24. So in verse 19, it says, they shall partake of the abundance of the seas and of treasures hidden in the sand. And in verse 24, it says, Asher's most blessed of sons, let him be favored by his brothers. Let him dip his foot in oil. And because of those two verses, there was a guy back in the 80s who looked at those verses and, and thought, I wonder if God's talking about oil. I wonder if that's what he's talking about there. It's really interesting that every Middle East country um, around Israel has oil, and Israel for decades and decades and decades had none. Every time that they would drill, they wouldn't find anything. And so there was an American, he was a Texan, actually, who decided to go and drill for oil in Israel, and he found out where the, where the land of Zebulun was and where the land of Issachar was, and he's looking for treasures hidden in the sand, and he began boring for oil, and he never found it. Same thing with Asher. Asher's over on the coastline. And uh, he uh, drilled some wells looking for it. Never found it. And it doesn't mean that it's not going to be found. It, I mean, that, those verses may, be, may have a possibility of that. It's just deeper than, than he drilled if it's there. Um, he never found it, but they did find oil in Israel. Uh, but the oil that they found in Israel was on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, up in what they call Bashan in the, in the Bible. The Golan Heights is what we call it now. And so they found oil up there, and they've got enough oil to run the country for, for, for centuries and um, it's just a matter of extracting it. They've also found uh, gas supplies. And one of the interesting things that's happened in the last oh, 10 years or so is um, Israel has been, become, instead of an energy importer, an energy exporter. And uh, um, they're actually um, going to be pretty wealthy uh, because of, of what they found. In any case, just wanted to let you know that, that that was taking place. You probably thought I was going to tell you he struck oil and all of that kind of stuff, and he didn't. You know, he's a, He was just looking for it because of those verses. It says of Gad, 
He said, blessed is he who enlarges God, our Gad. He dwells as a lion and tears the arm and the crown of his head. He provided the first part for himself because a lawgiver's portion was reserved there. He came with the heads of the people. He administered the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. And so um, Gad was one of the tribes that was a warring tribe, and he was in the vanguard of Joshua's army. And uh, they ended up getting their portion first uh, because of their faithfulness in uh, in battle. And so you can read about that in Joshua chapter 4 and Joshua chapter 22. Then he talks about Dan, and he says, Dan is a lion's whelp. He shall leap from Bashan. And Bashan, uh, again, is uh, what we would call the Golan Heights. And um, what's interesting is when Dan first got his portion, it was down in the south. It wasn't up in the north. They ended up moving because uh, they couldn't conquer in the south, and they moved their land up to the north. And that's, again, prophetic. Uh, that's a prophetic passage because that was not the case when they first got their portion. So Dan was down in the south by Judah. Later on, they asked to move north, and that's when they moved up north by the Golan Heights. And so you you have that. Being a lion's whelp um, is the idea of having the potential for great courage. And the tribe of Dan is where Samson came from, for example. And um, interesting that he, he calls him a lion's whelp or a lion's cub instead of a lion. And again, I think that the reason for that is because there's a potential there for great courage and great power, but it never really developed in either um, Samson or in the tribe. What you have with Samson, the story of Samson, is one of the guys in the Bible that has the most potential of anybody going. And what he does is he squanders it uh, because he's a partier and because he sleeps around and because he despises the things that the Lord gave him. And he ends up being blind and shaved and chained. And um, he ends up, his last act was an act of repentance, but in his last act, um, he ends up dying. And it's because he squandered what God had given him. He was a Nazarite from birth, which means he, he was set apart for the Lord. And he just kept messing with that, that commitment his whole life. And he never um, reached the potential that he had. And so that's probably part of what's being spoken about with the tribe of Dan. Of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full of the blessing of the Lord, possess the west and the south. And again, Naphtali was near Galilee, and that's an area um, with uh, great agricultural blessing. If you're going with us to Israel, we're going to go up around the um, land of, or the area of Galilee, and it's just surrounded by everything uh, you know, uh, they've got wheat fields, they, they've got all kinds of fruit, they've got, they've got bananas. The area around Galilee goes from subtropical uh, to arid. It's got, it's got all the tropical zones in between. And so it's one of the bread baskets of the land of Israel. And so these guys are living in that area. And then Asher, uh, again, has uh, military strength. Asher is most blessed of sons. Let him be favored by his brothers. Let him dip his foot in oil. Your sandals shall be iron and bronze as your days, shall you, so shall your strength be. And uh, literally the tribe of Asher, the, the boundaries of their um, inheritance, uh, uh, specifically the outline of the uh, geography, his, his country looks like a leg from the knee down. And so when it says, um, let him dip his foot in oil, uh, your sandals uh, shall be iron and bronze as your days, so shall your strength be. It's the idea of abundance and blessing. Uh, when you dip your foot in oil, it's, it's kind of the idea that you have so much that you don't have to wash your feet with water, you can wash it with oil. And so it's talking about blessing on the people of Asher. And so you have that. There is no one like the God of Jeshurun. And so this ends in praise again. Who rides the heavens to help you and in his excellency on the clouds. The, er, the eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say destroy. Then Israel shall dwell in safety, the fountain of Jacob alone, in a land of grain and new wine. His heavens shall also drop dew. Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. Your enemies shall submit to you, and you shall tread down their high places. God's the eternal refuge. 
You're the eternal God is your refuge. And that's what's supposed to be happening. He's the one that I run to. He's the one that I'm protected by. He's my fortress. The Bible talks about the fact he's a strong fortress and he's a high tower. He's my refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. It's the idea of when I fall, I'm going to get caught. And I'm going to be caught by, by the one who loves me the most. He's the one who protects me. He's the one who takes out my enemies. He's the one who blesses me. He's the one who gives me safety. He's the one who I'm saved by. A people who is like you. A people saved by the Lord. He's my shield. He's my help. And he's the sword of my majesty. And so, uh, again, something that um, Moses is proclaiming over the people of Israel, but applies equally to us. And then in chapter 34, you have the end of the book. And in the end of the book, you get Moses' last glimpse of, glimpse of the promised land. And so Moses went up from the plains of Moab uh, to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan, all Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah as far as the western sea the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zoar. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land of which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. And so Moses is given his view of the promised land. He never, get, he never makes it in, he never goes into the promised land until you get to the New Testament. And in the New Testament on the Mount of the Transfiguration is the first time that you ever see Moses in the land of promise. And he's going to be the ones, one of the ones who is coming back with us when Jesus returns at the second coming. And um, uh, he's for sure going to see the land of promise there if he's not one of the two witnesses. He may be one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. And so it looks like it may be Moses and Elijah. And so Moses has at least one appearance in the promised land in the Mount of the Transfiguration. He may have a second appearance in the promised land in the book of Revelation. He's for sure going to have a third appearance in the promised land when Jesus comes back with us. And so that's a cool thing. He didn't make it then, but he's going to make it. And so that's, that's a pretty cool thing. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he, talking about the Lord, buried him in a valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows his grave to this day. Why do you think God did that? Because if he didn't do that, there'd be this big, huge shrine over the grave of Moses. And people would have been worshiping Moses for years. So what God does is he makes it a private ceremony. And it's just him and the Lord. And so uh, he, he brings Moses there um, to the mount. And it's on the mountain that Moses dies. And then it looks like it's God who carries him down the valley and into, into this valley where God makes a grave and God buries him. Kind of a cool thing because what would happen with Moses is um, his eyes would close and he, he would open them up in paradise and be seeing the Lord. And the Lord being who he is, he can be in more than one place at a time, right? God's omnipresent. And so... The Lord's probably talking to Moses while the Lord's burying Moses at the very same time. And so there's this act of, of love that's taken place. One of the last things you get to do for your, for your loved ones is bury them. And it should be something that's honorable and it should be something that's sweet and it should be, should, should be something that's sad and, um, because death is an enemy. But I like it that it's the Lord who did this. I think, I think that's pretty cool. The Lord loved Moses. And so he buries him, and it says, verse 7, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim. That means he didn't have to have glasses. <laughs> his eyes were not dim, nor his nat natural vigor diminished. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses ended. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him, so the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. And so the baton is passed to Joshua now, and in the very next bush, book, Joshua is the one who leads the people of Israel. And then finally it says, But since then there's not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And that again is something that we want to go after. I want to, you know, when I spend time with the Lord, I want to be hearing from him. When I spend time with the Lord, I want, I want to, I want to pray and I want to hear his voice. 
I want to, I want to talk to him and I want it to be like a face to face type of communication. I don't want it to be anything less than that. And there's no reason that we should be satisfied with anything less than that. The greatest of the prophets in the Old Testament doesn't even compare to, uh, the people of the New Testament. Jesus said John the Baptist was the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than him. And the reason for that is because of the fact we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in our hearts. There's no reason to be satisfied with this relationship with God where, you know, we feel like he's off in the boonies someplace and we never hear from him. God wants to speak to me. He, he wants me to hear from him. And I need to not be satisfied with anything less than the kind of relationship that Moses had with God. And um, I'm not saying that you're going to necessarily have a face-to-face appearance of God in front of you, but that's not something that's impossible. God can do anything he stinking pleases, can't he? And so if God wanted to appear face-to-face to, with me, I'd be scared, but I'd be good. I'd be good with it, right? Uh, but in any case, I don't want to be satisfied with anything less than hearing his voice. And so hasn't arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face-to-face in all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt before Pharaoh, before all his servants, and in all his land. And by all that mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. And obviously Moses didn't write this part. There's an editorial comment that's placed at the book of, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, probably by Joshua. And these are probably the words of Joshua uh, talking about Moses. But it's God speaking through Joshua in doing this. I was talking about this this, this morning. Um, there is There are a number of passages in the Bible that talk about God glorifying us. And most times when people think of of being glorified by God, they think of being made big, being made strong, being made shiny, being, you know, like glorified in heaven. You're like an angel. You're like, you know, you're like awesome and and that kind of stuff. And um, I I started getting into Greek a few years back, uh, you know, quite a few years back. And one of the things that really struck me when um, I was reading my Bible in Greek is I come across this word glorify and it doesn't mean that. The context can allow for that, but what the word actually means is to speak well of. That's what the word glorify means. And so every time you see glorify in your New Testament, Old Testament too, when you see glorify there, it means to speak well of, to say good things about. And that's what's happening right here. God is speaking well of Moses in this instance. Let me, let me show you a passage. This is out of the book of Romans. And this is in Romans 8. And you're probably familiar with it. <clears throat> let, me, let me get here. Um, in Romans chapter 8, it says, um, verse 29, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's the idea that God looks down through the ages and he sees me and he predestines that I should become like Jesus, that I should be conformed to the image of Jesus. Moreover, verse 30, whom he predestined, these he also called. And what that's letting you know is that long before I became a Christian, God had a plan for my life, and then he called me. Okay, Whom he called, these he also justified. And after he called me and I received his call, What God did, past tense, was he justified me. He made me right with him. And then it says, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. These he also glorified. And that again is in the past tense. So some people, when they're interpreting this passage, they interpret it like this. Those whom he called, um, he also justified. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. And so people teach it like you're already in heaven, you've already been glorified, you don't have anything to worry about. That is not what the passage is actually saying. What the passage is actually saying is that right now, um, actually even in your past, right now, God has glorified you. He saw you from the beginning, he chose you, and then he called you. And he said, I want you as my own. You received him, and what he did was he justified you. And after he justified you, he began glorifying you. And again, what that means is he speaks well of you. And so who is he speaking well of you to? 
And you have some examples of this in the Bible. In the book of Job, when Satan appears before, before God, he goes, have you considered my servant Job, an upright man? Always does the right thing, never does anything wrong. And what he's doing is he's glorifying Job in front of Satan. And I imagine that, that when God looks at you, you, you know, it, it's like you get up in the morning and you spend time with the Lord, and the Lord goes, Michael, look at this chick. She said, I don't know if God calls you a chick, but <laughs> look at her. She gets up every morning and there she is sitting before me, spending time with me. Look at her. Look, listen to her prayer. Look at this guy. He spends time with me. He focuses on me. When you stand up and you do the right thing, God's probably going, look at this, you know, <laughs> gathering people around, going, look at him. And he's glorifying you. And the other thing that, that will happen is he'll do that in the sight of people who are here on the earth. God will put you in positions where um, uh, if you're useful to him, in the sense that you're going to be faithful to him, he'll put you in positions where he knows that you're going to be the person who's going to do the right thing. You're going to stand up in the situation, and when you stand up in that situation, he'll make sure that people see this and that, you, that you're glorified because of it. God is, God is in the habit of bragging on his children. That's what he does, and that's what he's doing with Moses. I like that a whole lot more than I have ever liked being shiny. I like that a whole lot. You know, I don't need to be big. I don't need to be buff. I don't need to be you know, you know, tough up in heaven. But, but hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord, that would be awesome. Look at, look at, look at Steve's life. Look at, look at how he allowed me to use him. Look at what he's done, you know, that kind of stuff, being bragged on by your dad. I, you know, I, I didn't have a dad thing going on when I was a kid, so I got very little um, affirmation from a male figure in my family. Actually, I got very little affirmation at all. I didn't have I didn't have anybody that that said much about me, and that's you know I'm not I'm not whining about it. I you know uh, it's like that's just not going to happen with my kids. You know that's 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 the case with that. I just do the opposite of what happened in my family. To hear from God, well done. That's a that's a cool thing. I like it when my children do something right, and you know I I kind of heap praise on them anyway. But when they, when they do something right and they do it well, um, I usually don't spend a whole lot of time talking to them about it, but I'll look them in the eye and I'll go, well done. That was good. <laughs> and when I do it to my son, he just beams, man. He just beams. And that's the, that's the kind of thing that I'm looking forward to with the Lord. And I don't even have to look forward to it. He's, he already does that in my life. He, there, there are times when he's, you know, when you do something right and you hear this voice in the back of your head going, Good job. <laughs> that was the right thing to do. You know, that's God glorifying you. That's the last thing that you hear about Moses. Deuteronomy is an awesome book. I use, it, um, I use it for devotions all the time. And so that's the book of Deuteronomy. Let's pray. Get you out of here. Thanks, Jesus, for your word. Thank you for guys like Moses. Thank you for people who will stand up. Obviously not a perfect guy. Um, he, he didn't do everything totally right. But, Lord, he was faithful to you and you were faithful to him. Thank you, Jesus, for, for the fact that that's what you're looking for in us. You're not looking for mighty works, and you're not looking for mighty power. You're not looking for, for anything great from us, but you do want to do great things in us, and you do want to do great things through us, and you do want to say great things about us. Lord, we, pe we pray that um, you'd help us to bend our will to you um, so that that can be done. And just give you the rest of the evening. Pray that you bless it. Watch over these people, bless their week, and uh, ask that you do this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. God bless you guys.